Today's gospel is actually a continuation of last week's gospel, which was taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 4. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue was filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so they may might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I've preached in my home congregation once. It can be rough. Two of my former teammates were right there up front. They knew my temper. They had heard me curse a bad call or mouth off to a ref. A few pews behind them sat a former teacher. She knew how lazy I could be, how mischievous, how arrogant. And my former girlfriend was there. I shudder to think what she knew. That's just the thing. These people know you. Yet no matter how much they know, no matter how much they've seen, no matter how much they remember, they were gracious welcomed me back home and celebrated my accomplishment. And that's pretty much the way it starts out in today's reading. Jesus has come home. He is preaching to a crowd of people who've known him since he was just knee-high. And they are pleased and proud and gracious. Isn't that Joseph's boy? Where did he learn to read? And with such authority. He was born to it, I'm telling you. Born to it. 
So what goes wrong? How does this tender little homecoming suddenly turn ugly? I hate to say this, but it's Jesus' fault. Right in the middle of all their pride and praise, Jesus just goes off. No doubt you'll quote to me the old proverb, Doctor, heal yourself. And you'll probably want me to do here what you've heard I've been doing in Capernaum, that land so full of Gentiles. Well, guess what? No prophet is accepted in his hometown. And when the prophets of old came to do miracles and wonders, more often than not, it was for Israel's enemies. What in the world has gotten into Jesus? Is he offended that they're surprised that he's done so well? Does he hear a challenge in their words? Who does he think he is anyway? He's just Joseph's son. Is he skeptical of their praise? Suspicious that they just want to exploit him as a healer? Or was he just in a really, really bad mood? I don't know. But here's my hunch. As well as these people knew Jesus, Jesus knew them even better. Remember that Jesus had just finished reading Isaiah's prophecy of a year of favor, the Jubilee year. When good news is preached to the poor, released to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, a time when the oppressed go free. And then Jesus sat down. Jesus left out what Isaiah says next. Telling of that day when the Lord will trample down all of Israel's enemies, crush them underfoot, and restore Israel to its rightful place. Jesus doesn't read that part. Jesus isn't thinking locally. He's thinking globally. The home crowd doesn't get it. So Jesus drives home his point so clearly that now they're ready to get him. God favor Syria, not Israel. God heal in Capernaum, not Nazareth. I don't think so. That's heresy. And you know what we do with heretics. It really is all Jesus' fault. He does the one thing you're never supposed to do to friends and neighbors. He tells them the truth. The truth about their pettiness and prejudice. The truth about their fear and shame. And so they want him gone in the most permanent of ways. Here at the very outset of Jesus' ministry, we already see how it's going to end. They'll listen a little longer, get a little madder, and then lay their hands on him and nail him to the cross. This is the heart of the matter. Jesus came preaching. 
The time is up. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. But Jesus' words did him no good. They only got him killed. Wasted as one quite superfluous to the way we think things should be run. It is vain for us to construct the Jesus that we would not have killed had we been there. If only he had done or said the right thing, so goes our complaints. But it's too late. The time is up. The cock has crowed. We killed him. Only God approved. God raised him from the dead. So Jesus the preacher became Jesus preached as Lord and Savior, the very Son of God. Of all the shocking and offensive things that God has done to us, this no doubt tops them all. God accepts and vindicates the one we rejected. This is the stumbling block, not only the impetus for proclamation, but its essential content. How Jesus, the preacher, became Jesus who was and is preached. The authorization for me to stand here before you this day and proclaim to you the actual doing of the deed, the electing itself. As St. Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If there is no proclamation, there can be no faith. And with no faith, all is in vain. Nevertheless, we continue to endeavor to construct out of the ruin of our misdeed a Christ who is amendable to us. Whatever sort that turns out to be, orthodox, fundamental, conservative, liberal, progressive, leftist, or middle of the road. A Jesus one might be persuaded to choose if one is sufficiently conjoled. Then we can judge him and like Pilate, wash our hands of the matter. In other words, we don't get drawn into the story but rather remain more or less above it. More or less in control. No consciousness of bondage, no release from captivity, no death and resurrection, only a demand that Jesus meet our religious needs. A paradigm a free choice, confirming that the one who told the truth in the first place be nailed to a cross. But of all the prophets, of all the people who came and told the truth, only to be rejected or beaten or killed, Jesus is the one God raised from the dead. Jesus is the one revealing not only the truth about us, but also about the very Godness of God. You see, this is God's righteousness. This is God's self-vindication. This is God claiming his right to be God. 
what we are blind to is not the law of God, but the glory of God. Calling into being that which is from that which is not. The essence of sin is to fall short of the glory of God. The essence of sin is to attempt to bargain with God on the basis of the law. The essence of sin is to refuse to let God be God. But no longer. That is now over. In Jesus, God has reclaimed the right to be God here and now. Making faith in God possible. Here's the thing. When Jesus tells the truth about us, simply because it is the truth, we have to give up the pretense. Surrender every claim to having it all together, to being perfect, to making it on our own. In short, we die. And at the same time, when Jesus tells us, or really shows us the truth about God. We come to life. We come alive in the Spirit of God, who not only knows everything about us, but goes to great lengths to redeem us from all the pettiness, shame, and fear that seem so often to overrun even the most successful of lives. And alive in the Spirit, we do these things proclaiming, freeing, comforting, releasing. Find it hard to believe? Tell that to Paul, the author of that famous hymn of love we just heard a few moments ago, who early in his career persecuted Christians. He was then known as Saul. Saul was zealously on his way to Damascus to put a stop to the mischief when he encountered the risen Lord and was struck down. Paul, don't you see? It's all over. According to the story, it took a while to see, but Saul, the persecutor, became Paul, the proclaimer. A startling discontinuity. Now, discontinuity is probably those, one of those words that we will want to learn, a new word each day. Discontinuity is really too abstract a word. Paul put it much more radically and concretely. He said, I died. The old life came to an end. So the new one could begin as I was made a new creature in Christ by this shocking act of God. Still not convinced? Take a look around you right now. This congregation is filled with people who having been touched by the grace of God can't be kept away whether it's cold or fog or sleet or hail or rain or dark of night, they're here. Because you have been baptized in Christ Jesus, you have died with him. And because Christ is raised from the dead, so also you are now alive, raised to a life of grace and good works. Your calling is to speak that promise, to announce that time of God's favor Isaiah predicted and Jesus announced is fulfilled in your hearing. As the preacher who is now preached as Lord and Savior propels you to continue the mischief he started by proclaiming God's right to have mercy on whom he will have mercy knocking everyone out of the saddle, claiming the right to be your God here and now. 
in the present, working faith in you, turning you into a new recreated person who gladly hears the word. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And finally, speak the word, the truth about God. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. In Jesus, the preacher who is now preached, a new age has dawned. Amen.